Biobalance HealthCast, episode 176, Responding to Suicidal Thoughts. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're going to talk about hormones and people who become suicidal without them. Now this never came across my radar, except periodically people would say, I was thinking about suicide before I came to you, and I was afraid to tell you. But when I gave it my last chance, my last chance was replace testosterone, replace my hormones. And then when they came back, they told me, they told me the whole story. So I was thinking about that, but I'm no longer thinking about that. And all I could think of was, what if they told me they were still thinking about it? Because that's not something within my training, Your realm, yeah. but it is something that I think everyone should know and should be able to discern when someone says, I'm suicidal, what are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to ask? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's just something that I have a lot of experience with in my mm-hmm. field because I've dealt with an awful lot of people that were at one time or another suicidal or said that they were. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have to go through a process. And, and there are some myths about dealing with the issue of suicide mm-hmm. that I'd like to put to, to bed today if, if we can in our conversation. Um, as a professional, you have certain obligations. You are required by law to respond to that statement. I'm, re- I'm supposed to call the ER and say, send an ambulance and keep the patient there or send, and, if, and get their family there. If in your judgment. And right. this is where the professionalism comes in. Mm-hmm. They are immediately at risk. Right. What these women were telling you is that they were not immediately at risk. Mm-hmm. So then based on better. your perception of their level of connection and mm-hmm. enthusiasm and, and cogency, you say, that's great, I'm glad, and, and it's so sad that you felt that way, but now things are better. Or you say, if you are continuing to feel depressed and despairing, let's get you a referral to somebody that can help you with mm-hmm. that. Because that's what people need to do. And, and I, I used to do a lot of teacher workshops because adolescents chronically will say during times of frustration or hardship, well, I'll just kill myself. Which strikes complete fear, fear yes. in the teachers and the parents yes. and anyone else who's close to them Absolutely. listening because we don't know what to do, really. Well, and you don't. And so I would do workshops with teachers who would say, oh, my God, you know, I went home, I didn't sleep all night, I didn't know what mm-hmm. to do, I'm worried about this kid. And there's an, an assessment process that you go through. Uh, the most fundamental thing is if you hear that and you don't know what to do, talk to somebody that does. So I would tell the teachers, go and talk to the school counselor. Go and talk to the principal. Uh, call the parents and say, your kid said this, and I don't know what to do with this. Mm-hmm. But as you learn more about this, you, you do learn to make assessments. I mean, there's a thing called a scale of lethality. How lethal is the thinking? You want to know about uh, method. You want to know about immediacy. You want to know about intent. Is there a plan? I mean, you ask those questions. Do you have a plan? Do you have a method picked out? Do you have the wherewithal for that method? Because, I mean, some... How would you ask that question, though? I I would say... You would ask the patient... Do you have a plan? And what is the plan? And what is the plan? What are you going to do specifically? What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to shoot myself. All right, do you have a gun? Well, no, but my grandpa has a gun locked in his closet, and he's not going to be home Saturday. And so Saturday, so the more specific and detailed the information is, the more, the more at risk they are. Okay. But if they're sort of just globally like, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just shoot myself. Well, do you have a gun? No. Are you planning to get a gun? No. <laughs> then they're not immediately at risk. Right, but they still need counsel. They still need somebody to hear what they've just said and, and respond to that because mm-hmm. that's one of the myths. There's, there's two myths. One is... When people say talking about it increases the level of risk. So if I hear you say that and then I start to ask you questions about it, I make you think about it Mm -hmm. because you're trying to answer my questions, and I increase the likelihood that you'll do something dangerous to hurt yourself. The data shows the exact opposite. Opposite. Talking about it helps them back away from the edge. They need to be able to verbalize this awful thing, and when they can get it out, it's out. It's not in. And mm-hmm. somebody is listening and attending and taking it seriously. And it's more real when you talk about something. And that's really, really helpful. Because to... if they don't want to really do that, mm-hmm. they'll recognize that this is something that, you know, is going to ruin all their plans. 
Well, <laughs> and that's a question that you ask when you, when you do an interview about suicidal focusing. You ask them uh, grounding questions. Uh, I mean, wh wh if I have somebody that's in an immediate suicidal crisis, if somebody calls me in the middle of the night and says, I called you to say goodbye, and that's happened to me many times. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for all your help, but it didn't. It wasn't enough, and I just can't do this anymore. I'm going to kill myself when I get off the phone. There are things that you have to do. I mean, I have had situations where I've had to keep this person on the phone, call the police, say go to the police, go to the house. Here's the address. Break in and stay on the phone with the person until the police literally get in the house and pick up the phone and say, "I've got it," and then I can let go and maybe I meet him at the hospital or whatever. But that that's really rare. Most mm -hmm. of the time. People talk about it, and if, if they're in a more immediate level of risk, you you ask them grounding questions. Why today? I mean, I hear you, and I understand that you think that it, it's time to just be out of this. But what happened today? What's different about today than yesterday? And and what if you made it through today until tomorrow? Would it look the same? Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about them, you know, like if you were to do this, you know, your son gets home from school at three o'clock. Is he going to find you? Is you know how will that impact him? Because a lot of times, parents in particular will hold on for their children when they wouldn't hold on for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, if I can get them to start thinking about their son or their daughter and about the the process of that, and I have dealt with children who have come home and found oh, a suicided it, parent it, yeah, I and know find the, the body. That as children. And those children are damaged for their lifetime because children always believe somehow. It was their fault. If it's my fault, I knew that mom was depressed. I knew that mom was upset and worried, and I didn't do well on my test. I asked for uh, some special thing that put more stress on her. I wasn't home on time. I wasn't I home wasn't. on time. So, how would you ask the person who's suicidal? What would you? What question would you ask them? Because telling them things doesn't work. It has to be yeah. a question to engage mm -hmm. them. So, what would be the question that you would specifically ask them? That would make them get out of that. They get very, they get kind of in a tunnel. They don't think about anything else. Right. So they're in this tunnel, and and you have to bring them out of the tunnel to remember their life mm -hmm. and to remember the people that depend on them. Mm -hmm. So what what question would you ask them the, to bring them out and talk about that? There are a range of questions, and it depends on the person and my knowledge of that person. Mm -hmm. If I know things that you have cared about or interested mm -hmm. in. Then I'll ask you a question about that. What's going to happen to your dog? Who's mm -hmm. going to take care of your dog? Uh, will your Will your husband take care of it? Will your daughter take care of it? Will your next door neighbor take your dog? Uh, mm -hmm. And that will break some of that that sense of floating isolation mm -hmm. because they now have to become grounded to think about a real world problem and, and to solve the problem. And in my experience, they never say, "Oh, I don't care about that." That'll be somebody else's problem because they care about that dog, mm -hmm. and and they don't want that dog to suffer, or they care about that child. When I mm -hmm. tell them your child will be wounded forever, because and I've had this argument, my child would be better off. I'm such a burden. I'm such a drag. Everybody would be better off. And when I tell them what I know about children and how children mm -hmm. respond to that, they change their perspective. Uh, oh, that's, typically, that's, they do. That's a very good key for people to know who have dealt with family members or friends. Yes. Who have actually started this process. Well, but we started by how seriously do you take the comment? And, and is it uh, little children and grade school kids all, statistically almost never commit suicide? Mm -hmm. I mean, like three in a hundred thousand, you know, will. Yeah, that's but, very. Uh, but kindergarten, first grade, second grade. When they get mad or something doesn't go their way, they'll say, oh, I'll just kill myself. And you have to intervene with that you, mm -hmm. as a parent. You have to stop that. And you say, we don't talk that way. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, it's just like parents, and those of you that are watching that are parents, how many times have you ever said to your kid, you have to use your words. You know, you right. can't just get mad and punch a wall or hit your sister or kick me. You have to learn to use your words. You have to say, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I'm sad, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. But you can't physically act it out. Well, the same thing with I'm suicidal. I'll kill myself. You can't say that unless you really mean it. Mm -hmm. And if you really mean it, some really drastic things are going to happen. We're going to the hospital. And you're going to be locked up behind a door. Well, I don't know that if you, you say that. Out of. No, I think, you, I mean, you for may a say teenager, that to teenagers, but not to little kids. Not to kids. a little kid, but what you, a teenager what you say that is, works. We're going to the doctor, we're going to the hospital. Yeah, to a teenager, you can say, I will take that seriously. You will be in the hospital within, you know, the police will pick you up if you run away. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get you hospitalized. And then they're going to put you in a lockdown unit. Uh, and 
some of these kids have been in and out of those systems mm -hmm. and they know what it's like to be in those units. But some of them don't. And, and, and you have to learn the difference. Most teenagers, the typical teenager, will have some suicidal fantasies. Mm -hmm. And they generally are around the, the concept of they're, they're mad, they're hurt. Mm -hmm. It's somebody, girlfriend, mm -hmm. dad, mom, it doesn't matter, teacher. And their thought process is, I will kill myself and then you'll be sorry. And they make this whole Mark Twain fantasy mm -hmm. of the, the girlfriend that jilted them and done them wrong, comes mm -hmm. to the funeral and cries and said, oh, if only I'd known. And I'd, and they just they, they create this elaborate fantasy to make themselves feel better. They are not at risk to hurt themselves. That is just a, uh, a self-soothing strategy mm -hmm. to make themselves feel better. Okay. So you have to distinguish, is this what my kid is doing or mm -hmm. is my kid at risk? So then you look at other behavioral pieces of information. Have they begun to isolate themselves? Have they changed radically? Have they experienced a loss? Do they stay in their room all the time and listen to music with the lights out? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mainly what you're looking for is a significant change. Has okay. something altered in their behavior pattern? Mm -hmm. And then you have to talk to them about it. I, I deal with parents constantly who are afraid to ask those questions. Because because they don't know, and they're afraid to bring it up, because then they'll do something. Mm -hmm. Then they'll do something that can't be reversed. Right. Well, and, and so then talk about grown-ups. Grown-ups talk about suicide as well, or they mm -hmm. feel suicidal. Like your two female patients mm -hmm. who had tried everything they could think of to try. Their lives were declining in hope and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. There's a hopelessness that comes with suicidal depression of I don't see a way forward. And many of those people attempt suicide, in not in the teenage fantasy of I'll kill myself and then you'll be sorry. Right. They attempt suicide to say... I don't want to hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I want so a way out. I want a way out. Uh, and a lot of them position themselves mentally to gamble. And what they say is, I'm going to attempt suicide, and if it's meant to be, then I'll just die. But if God doesn't want me to die yet, mm -hmm. somebody will save, save me. me. You know, my next door neighbor will come over and mm -hmm. borrow a cup of sugar. My, my husband will come home from work early today to for some reason and find me and then I will live and then I will know that the universe wants me to stay alive. And that's a real threat. That's a real threat. Okay. And and I'm just trying to discern the real threats from the ones that we can handle at not at an emergency level. Right. Well, the the first intervention that you make is the scale of lethality. You ask the what, when, where, how, why, how mm -hmm. questions. So, do you have a method? Do you have a plan? Do you have the equipment that the plan requires? Mm -hmm. And the more specifically they can answer those questions, mm -hmm. the more immediately they are at risk. Okay. If they do not have specific answers to those, how would you kill yourself? I don't know. I'm just going to. You know, I'll do something. Mm -hmm. Well, have you thought about what you would do? Well, you know, no. Or, yes, I'll hang myself. Do uh, you ask Do that? you have a rope? Yeah. And I said, do you have a rope? No. Are you going to use an electric cord? No. Are, are you going to do it in the basement? I mean, the more specifically you can get okay. them to talk about it, the more information you get, and the more grounded they become. Okay. So you... They're you, less likely to go through it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that's that's very important, and that's at any level. That's at any level. So right. any age. Right. And are there any other signs that we don't have to get so excited? Like, what are, what are the signs of people who are just trying to get attention? Now, there are people who do that. Well, there are people who do that, but, but that doesn't mean they don't need help. And, and that's another help. one of those myths. In, in our culture, there are an awful lot of people who, when they hear so-and-so is suicidal or so-and-so says, I'll kill mm -hmm. myself, their response is, you just want attention. Right. And you know? and that's that's a bad way to respond. respond because you're just saying, oh, I don't want to worry about that, so pff, right. we're not going to worry about it. But that doesn't stop it. And I'm dismissing the seriousness of your pain mm -hmm. and, and the value of your it's message. It's exactly the opposite of what should what be they done. Need. Yes. No. You, you, you need to say, tell me more about that. I want to hear about that. Why do you feel that way? What needs to, to happen? And not just dismiss them and say, oh, you're a manipulator or you're a mm -hmm. drama queen or that's not really what's going on. Now, that's the first level response. Mm -hmm. For layered responses, I mean, if you do that in the immediate mm -hmm. moment, you may come to the conclusion, I can't handle this right. or there's more here that I'm not the right person to deal with. So now I want to get you into counseling. I want to get a referral for you. 
And this is a good way when your spouse doesn't think that your child or your yes. friend or or someone who's very important to that other person doesn't think they need counseling mm-hmm. because they're just being a drama queen. These are things that you can tell them to actually say, yes, we should take action. Yes. We can't just blow this off. It'll make everything worse, and, and their pain is worse if we do that because we're not validating them. Well, and there are issues among adolescents, too, with copycat suicides. We have situations where in a school district there will be a cluster of suicides. Really? And I haven't paid attention to that. It, it's not real common, but it's not real rare. Mm-hmm. And it does happen. And, and you'll have lovers who make a suicide pact. And then some of their friends decide, well, you know, we'll kill ourselves too. Uh, it's important that the adults in that environment pay attention to the kids. When I taught high school, I used to literally, uh, all, all high school teachers have to do hall duty in between mm-hmm. periods as students are moving from one class to mm-hmm. another. You're supposed to stand out and monitor the progress. <laughs> I literally had kids that I would know that would be in my classes who would not walk down my hallway because they knew that I would see them. And if I saw that they were not themselves, I'd confront them and say, what's going on mm-hmm. with you? You know, you mm-hmm. seem to be depressed. Something seems to be wrong. What's up with you? And they don't want to be seen and yet they do, you know. And right. so mm-hmm. they test it. You know, they walk down the highway, uh, hallway, hallway, and see if I would respond. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they would have avoided it for a while before that. So I guess my comment is: pay attention to your child. Yes, children are drama queens. Yes, they <laughs> act out, they speak out, they they fantasize all kinds of dramatic things. But you need to be paying attention to their behaviors as well as to their words. Mm-hmm. I mean, kids will say things. I you do a lot of family counseling, and especially with adolescents, people would get all up because some kid said something disrespectfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and parents want to crush that. You, know, you can't allow that. Or, especially if we're dealing with consequences, and say, well, you know, if the kid is acting out in this way or he's speaking disrespectfully, what's your consequence for that? And they just mm-hmm. say, well, consequences don't work. And I'd say, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, I'm going to tell my kid, you know, do this, and he's going to say, I don't care. Mm-hmm. And I would say, don't listen to that. Don't pay any attention to that. Don't give that any energy. Look at their behavior. If you apply the consequence, does their behavior change? Mm-hmm. If it does, you have to give them a little ego space to be able to say, I don't like that. I don't like you. Mm-hmm. But if they <laughs> modify their behavior, it's, it's okay. So you, if, But if your child has a radical change in behavior, or your wife or your husband, mm-hmm. if they start to disappear, and sometimes what you see is they go down into a depression, they're, really, they're, they're slower, they're lethargic, they're non-responsive, they're withdrawn, and then suddenly there's a burst of energy. And maybe they're giving things away. You know, like okay, I'm giving yeah. my girlfriend my favorite album because I just want her to have it. Well, that's a warning sign, mm-hmm. and you should know that and come in and say, what are you doing? What's going on? What's this all about? That's Don't be afraid to do that. Mm-hmm. And y- you have to deal with it. It's, it's serious. So in in my circumstance, I know how to deal with it as a physician right. in my office. And and I I wouldn't have gone through the whole process because right. I would have just... You would have seen would have their seen, level of distress was right. high enough that you would have said, you know what, you need to go to the emergency room or here's right. the name of a counselor. I want you to make an appointment. And I don't want to know that you made the appointment. Right. Let's call now. Yeah, let's call, let's call yeah. somebody now. But... Really productive, smart people mm-hmm. won't tell you. Yeah. Won't tell a physician because they know the consequences. So unless they, they're truly at their wits' end and need help, right? And some that's of true. them will do that, and that's what we're talking about. Those that at that level, I find that adults who actually have, and this has happened over time, multiple times. So, but adults who feel like there is no way out. Mm-hmm. They, they can't see a window or a door to get out of the box that they're in. Those are the people that I am more serious about. Right. And if I can give them hope that it's going to be different, just like mm-hmm. the depression caused by lack of hormones, I can say, well, let's just give this a four-month trial. You know, yeah. come back and see me. Let's see Excellent. how you're doing. Yes. So, and, and testosterone is a mood elevator, and it's better than antidepressants. Right. And many people won't take antidepressants, but they'll take hormones because it gives them a lot of other things, too, right. besides just their mood. But but in that case, I mean, I'm not suggesting that people take hormones for for suicidal ideation. That's not no. my... No, no, no. But people who actually have hormonal imbalances often 
become so distraught because that, that there's no an way they think out. About. Yes, their their whole self has changed, and they don't yes. find a way out that they can be themselves in the future. Then sometimes it would be it would be worth protecting them after you know with the treatment itself or. Sometimes it, it's more necessary to do it immediately and not treat them, but somehow they need to know that there's hope that there's a way out of this. Well, and, and to go back to your original question about how do I know how to understand the seriousness of, mm-hmm. of this, as a physician, you have a responsibility to know their history. Mm-hmm. And if they have a history of suicide attempts, people that are frequent flyers, people mm-hmm. that are multiple attempters, are more and more at risk. Uh, Each time. The ones that actually kill themselves typically have a history of multiple attempts. And they just cut the margin of error smaller and smaller, and they finally make a mistake, and they die. Uh, and, and it's a statistical normal. It's not an every case normal. I mean, right. uh, so, so if you have that history, it can help you uh, decide how aggressively you need to intervene. Patients don't always tell you their history. They when don't always When you come in and you that. ask them questions, they don't always put that in under yeah. hospitalizations or illnesses or... Well, and, and so if you make the referral and they come to somebody mm-hmm. like me, it wouldn't be appropriate for a physician because it, it's a different relationship. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I would do is get what we call a safety contract. From session to session, I would I would get a promise mm-hmm. that they would not do anything intentionally or unintentionally, right. on purpose or accidentally, mm-hmm. to put themselves at risk or hurt themselves mm-hmm. until the next time they came in to see me. I see. That's a good idea. And oddly enough, people honor that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you and, and if you're working with them and you don't ask for the safety contract, it's like you're giving them permission to go ahead and do something because you didn't you didn't save them, you didn't care enough. But you ask for the safety contract. If they won't give you a safety contract in the discussion mm-hmm. that you're having, that's when you have them hospitalized. I see. But that's Important. not stuff most of you deal with. What what most of you need to hear is watch the behavior. If you hear the verbiage, take it seriously. If you don't know what to do, take them to a professional and get some help. If you think you know what to do and and you can determine that this is a cry for help, this is a statement of distress, and we can work on that, okay. But there's always a risk. I mean, there's there's never a perfect safety guarantee. There's always a risk in not having a professional do this. So Even so with the, a professional, we don't always know. True. We don't always get That's it. That's true. But you're at the, it's like sending someone to a specialist. Yeah. Once they've gone to a generalist, it's at least putting them in the hands of the person that could best handle this, right. which is not sometimes not the family that are embroiled in this problem with, with this individual. Sometimes, in, in any case, I hope that and I believe that this will help you at least view people who have said these things mm-hmm. more compassionately and understand whether they are really at risk for immediate um, suicide or not Absolutely. and whether you should help or at help get them to the proper people we don't expect you to don't do be afraid medical. to talk about it and ask specific questions and don't ignore it absolutely thank you for listening email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the biobalance healthcast on itunes and on youtube For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.